Facebook. We love y'all. Glad to have you here with us this Sunday morning. The title of my message is uh, and probably not unexpectedly from some of y'all, but uh, the title of my message is Trump and the Warrior King. Trump and the Warrior King. Before I go any further, let me make some very clear uh, explanations or my heart, and et cetera. First and foremost, I do not worship Donald Trump. I worship Jesus Christ. I do not put my faith in Donald Trump as an individual. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. I get that out of the way first and foremost. I'd also say to you this morning that, oh, the devil is mad. I think he's furious. I think God has prophesied many things that we saw come to pass this past week. And it gives me hope. It gives me hope. How many of you have ever gotten to a place where you say, God, I just don't feel like you are here. Or, uh, God, you know, if, if, if I'm still of use to you, show me or deal with me. And I believe that's kind of what happened this past week. I believe that God has let us know as America, he's not finished with us yet. Amen? He's not finished. He is not finished. The second thing I want to declare this morning is that I'm not preaching physical violence, dear God, the absolute opposite of that. But we have to go back into the Old Testament, and in the Old Testament, there was physical violence in order to get away or do away with evil. We all know that. God gave the command, kill them all. And it was, mur- it was to be, they were to be murdered, killed, done away with, the evil people were. Today, we live in, a, in an era and in a time where we are fighting in the spirit, right? We are under, a, our battle is not with flesh and blood. We are fighting a spiritual warfare. However, the fact that we fight a spiritual warfare does not negate the Old Testament stories, the Old Testament books of the Old Testament and what God did back then. So I want to look for a parallel. And and this is, uh, I'm going to tell you up front that some of this has been uh, around for a long time. I believe that Jonathan Kahn is an absolute man of God. How about y'all? And by the way, he is going to be in Bradenton, January 30th in Bradenton. You ought to make an effort to go over there at the Christian retreat, and we'll see that rascal. Last time I saw him, we got him to come here. We just may try that again. What do you think? All right. He was here in 2015. I think he's due for another visit. How about y'all? Hallelujah. We may, we'll check on that. Anyway. The warrior king, that is not my title. That is something that Jesus and the Old Testament declared a certain individual to be. But before I name this warrior king, I want you to understand that as we are walking through this morning and where we're at, where we've come from, and where we're going is going to be a fight. I think what the Lord just spoke is dead perfect timing as he always is. This is not a time for us to sit back and say, look at us, we got it prayed through. Well, look at us, we got it uh, answered our prayers and now all I gotta do is sit back and watch God do his thing and, uh, and, uh, you know, Trump's gonna take care of everything now and blah, blah, blah. If that is your attitude, this morning, we're going to call you down to altar and have a little repentance because I'm here to tell you, church, we're just now going to go to work. I said, God is now calling us to really go to work. Go to work praying. Go to work believing. Go to work sending out the message that my God is still on the throne. My God will turn the tables on the enemy. My God will deliver us. And I thank God that this week, that's exactly what happened. Amen? We have got to thank the Lord for this. The Bible says that he puts the people in power that he wants, and he tears down what he wants. And, and I'm going to be honest with you. I think if you were like me in 2020, uh, we were just absolutely the opposite of what we are this morning. We felt dejected. We felt like God had uh, uh, not failed us because he never fails us, but that God had turned his back on America 
And now as we're looking four years later, we're going to get some insight as to why that happened like it did. All I can tell you is this. When you put yourself in a position to be used by God, he's going to use you, amen? And God uses anybody he wants to use. Y'all hear what I just said? We as human beings judge people by their actions, by their words, by their deeds, and I understand that. But God also has a role that he can use even someone who is not living for him to edify and promote God's kingdom. Do y'all believe that? I hope you do because it's strictly Bible what I'm about to preach. So if you will, we can will start and uh, just for, I'm not get into the word quite yet, but this whole message comes out of Second Kings chapters nine and ten, and we're going to talk about this for just a moment. So let me set the stage here for a second of our country. First of all, if you recall in 2016, that was a uh, amazing election as well. We, uh, we had hope that Trump would do great and mighty things. We had hope that Trump would drain the swamp. Well, Trump got swamped in certain areas, right? Because I believe Donald Trump in 2016 is probably not the same Donald Trump in 2024. Come on now. But yet God used him in 2016. But what we saw back then was uh, a very powerful individual, a very determined individual, a very talented individual, someone who had the right vision, but perhaps had a poor way of executing some of the things. Perhaps uh, uh, maybe there was some pride involved there in 2016. Maybe, maybe there was not enough humility, not enough of giving God the credit for things, not enough of letting the people know that God is in control. But yet God had to intervene in 2016 or this country would have already been taken over by evil. Y'all understand that? So God has got a timeline that he's following and it is up to us, the church, whether we promote God's timetable and have an extension or do we dig our heels in and not do our role and have our time cut short. I believe that's up to the church. How about y'all? I believe this church is going to say, God, we submit ourselves to you. We're going to pray for this country like never before. We're going to preach hard messages against sin like never before. We're going to come against evil at the school board level, at the county commission level, at the state level, federal level. It doesn't matter. We as Christians have to take a stand for Jesus. You cannot live your life apologetically. If you do, God's not pleased with you. Hear me loud and clear. We are talking not about Democrat versus Republican or a Democrat versus Independent or Independent versus Republican. Tear off those party labels and throw them in the trash. What we are dealing with is good versus evil. It doesn't matter the label that's put on it. Y'all hear me? Republicans could be just as evil in their platform in the future as the Democrats are today. Read what they stand for. Read what the promotion is. Read what they're going to try to implement in this country, whichever party it may be, and let God give you the discernment. And folks, I'm going to tell you, if you cannot discern that the Democrats' platform is evil, then God help you come up here and we're going to get you saved right now. Come on, because you have a total blinded eye. So we know that God just brought this country out of an absolute horrific situation and has delivered us, and I feel like I'm standing on the other side of the Jordan River today. How about you? I'm not saying we've entered the promised land, don't get me wrong, but I'm telling you what, it was good to watch some of the Egyptians drown. For some reason, I don't have any empathy whatsoever for crocodiles' tears that were shed by Taylor Swift and all the other crazies out there. I have no empathy for that, none. You know what I do? I say God touched their heart. God let them open their eyes that they may see. And that's how I pray for those folks. But as far as me feeling sorry for the way they feel, 
No, that's what you get when you get your eyes off of Jesus. That's what you get when you turn away from the right way. So back in 2016, there was a, a comparison that was given by a lot of people with Trump. And these people were a lot of pastors throughout our country. And even Prime Minister Netanyahu called Trump a symbol or a lookalike of King Cyrus. Y'all remember that? King Cyrus. Well, King Cyrus was a pagan king over Persia, but he did something. He saved the Jews at the time. Well, that was a nice analogy. Okay, we can go with that. But this morning, we're not going to talk about King Cyrus and Trump because Cyrus did not accomplish what this king, this warrior king, did. So we're going to talk about the warrior king, and his name is Jehu. How many's heard that name before? Jehu. If you haven't heard about Jehu, then you have not read Jonathan Kahn's book called the paradigm, which I would really recommend you read that. And in the paradigm that was written in 2016, this goes back eight years now, right after the election, this book came out, and Jonathan Kahn said, Trump is more of a type and shadow of King Jehu than he was of Cyrus. Well, okay, so why did he get whipped? <laughs> you know, why isn't he in the White House if that's the case? Well, because it wasn't God's timing. Hello, I said it wasn't God's timing. It wasn't meant to be. There were some things that needed to happen first. So let's fast forward a little bit, and let's go before the election, and let's put ourselves in a room where the National Alliance of Faith gathered, and there in that meeting was Trump, there was Jonathan Kahn, there was Paula White, there was... Uh, Jensen Franklin, there was just a number of our great leaders in our faith were there, and they were there to proclaim Jesus. They were there to pray over Trump. They were there to uphold God's plan for Trump. And Jonathan Kahn gets up, and I'm not preaching Jonathan Kahn, y'all hear me. He's just a vessel that God uses. You understand that? I love the man. We've met him, obviously, personally, spent some time with him. He's a great man of God. But I'm not promoting Jonathan Kahn. I'm promoting how God has used Jonathan Kahn. Y'all understand that. And I do respect him highly, and I think he's a great man of God. So in this meeting, a prophecy came forth. Jonathan Kahn gets up in this meeting, and he says, President Trump, you were born into the world to be a trumpet of God a vessel of the Lord in the hands of God. God called you to walk according to the template. He called you according to the template of Jehu, the warrior king. Khan told the hundreds of Christian leaders who gathered last week at the National Faith Summit outside of Atlanta. He also shared a clip of his prophecy about Trump on his YouTube channel. And here we go. Now, what did I just read to you? I read to you that Trump is a vessel, not a savior. He is a vessel that God has put in this place for such a time as this. Trump is a vessel that God put into office in 2016 that kept the dam from bursting. It gave us a hope. It gave us a thrill. Uh, if we had had Jezebel elected in 2016, we'd be suffering at the hands of Jezebel. Hillary Clinton was Jezebel, if you don't want my analogy, okay? So we know that God stopped that. He held back the floodwaters, if you will. And I'm going to ask you a question. Do you think that over the last four years, the Democrats gained popularity, or do you think that after this election was over, that they have truly been exposed and are being exposed for just how evil their plans and schemes have been. Absolutely. So, you know what? God allowed this last four years to show the enemy clearly to the people. How in the world Harris got that many votes 
I cannot even comprehend it. I can't comprehend that this nation, 48, 49% of our people in this nation would have voted that way. So is there work to be done? Oh, yes, there is. So Jehu was a man who was a, a kind of a raucous guy. Raucous meaning uh, he was not a real strong Jewish believer. He was not a man of God. Jehu was a kind of a wild man, if you will. He had some characteristics that I can identify with. First of all, he was known to drive his chariot furiously. I love that man. <laughs> I've been known to do the same. How about some of y'all out there? Absolutely. He, would, he was uh, not reckless. He was not a reckless man, but he was a driven man. And he wanted to accomplish things speedily. He didn't like to wait. He didn't like to hold back when God gave him something to do or in the natural when he wanted to do something. Jehu attacked the problem and he got it done right or wrong, basically. He got it done. Now, Jehu was the son of a very godly king, which we're going to get into in a few minutes. So Jehu was brought up in righteousness. Jehu watched his father run the kingdom, if you will, and he watched his father tear down the Baal worship. He watched his father purge the nation. And then yet those Baal worshipers came back even stronger after his father stepped down as being king. And the nation now is being overrun by evil. How many believes America is being overrun by evil? Hallelujah, it is. So sometimes God has got to take strong action not sometimes, most of the time, in order to defeat the evil. Now, listen to me very carefully once again. Some people believe that Trump is the devil incarnate. You have heard all the, got all the stuff being spread about. It's amazing that before the election, he was a fascist. He was a Nazi uh, follower. He was a Hitler lover. He was this, he was that. And now after the election, all of a sudden, he's getting an invitation to come to the White House and all is well and we blah, 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 blah. Folks, the devil's lies ought to be so clearly exposed. Amen? So let's go into the Word of God for a moment. Let's understand why we are where we are and what can we expect over these next four years and what is the possibilities here? What is our role in this? Let's go into that. Let's turn to 2 Kings chapter 9, and we'll begin reading in verse 1. Chapter 9, verse 1. And Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Get yourself ready. Take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. Now, when you arrive at that place, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, who was the king, uh, the one I was talking to you earlier, the son of Nimshi, and go in and make him rise up from among his associates and take him to an inner room. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee and do not delay. Now, if I were that little young prophet right there, I would be thinking, what am I about to get myself into? Are you kidding me? I'm going to walk into a really rough place. There's going to be some really tough men in there. I'm going to single out Jehu, this man who's been known for his temperament, this man who's been known to be bloody in his warfare, and I'm going to pour oil on top of his head, and I'm going to anoint him king. And if I tarry there, I may lose my head because Prophet Elisha told me to pour it on him, give him the words, and then run like a rabbit. How much confidence would you have in carrying out that mission? 
This ought to be interesting, is what I'd be thinking. But sure enough, let's see what happens then. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he arrived, there were the captains of the army sitting. And he said, I have a message for you, commander. Jehu said, for which one of us? And he said, for you, commander. Then he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people of the Lord over Israel. You shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish. And I will cut off from Ahab all the males in Israel, both bond and free. So I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. The dogs shall eat Jezebel on the plot of ground at Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and he fled. Wow. Wow. Let me tell you something. When you get a strong word from God, the devil hates it. Y'all hear me? The devil hates to hear what this little prophet put on Jehu in that prophecy. At that time, Jehu was not a religious, I mean, he grew up in religion, but he himself was not acting according to a godly fashion. Can I just ask y'all something? When you heard some of the remarks that Trump made, especially in the 2016 election, uh, did you think maybe that was a godly vessel? <laughs> I would say anything but that. So why did God choose him? Why did God choose Trump to be the president in 2016? And why has God chosen Trump to be the president again in 2024? Well, I'll tell you why. God put within him that characteristics, that same personality, those leadership qualities, that same thing he put in Jehu, he has put inside of Trump. Y'all hear me? Jehu was very well respected for his courage. He was very well respected for being a man of decisiveness, of being a strong leader, and sometimes God has got to look past what we perceive as the right person, and he looks past that right person, and he chooses a Jehu to do his bidding. Come on. Well, Jehu did his bidding. You know what Jehu did? He did not doubt the word of God, first and foremost. See, when that little prophet poured oil on his head, Jehu accepted that anointing. He said, yes, this is a call from God. Yes, I accept this anointing. I believe this little prophet was speaking the word of God to me. I trust God. I saw him work for my father. I am blown away, in my words, that God would use me, being the man that I am. But since he has chosen me, I'm going to go forward in the anointing of the almighty God, and I will do the work of the living God. Now, folks, if we as Christians had that in us, we would tear this country apart. Come on, we would, y'all. If the Christians of this world would realize there is an anointing upon us to tear down the evil places, our country would not be in the mess that it's in today. It wouldn't be. If our Christian folks would get off their backside and quit worrying about offending people, we would go far. But I'm here to tell you, there's some teardowns of some bell worshipers coming. You know where it's going to start? Right here. Right here. In God's people. Right here. Because if you think Trump can do this all by himself, you are so wrong. Trump has been anointed for such a time as this. Hear me loud and clear. This is a God thing. He is no more, nothing more than a vessel 
that God has chosen to use for the, the deliverance of some of this mess that we're seeing. And I'm thanking God for that. How about y'all? So do I expect Trump to be uh, perfect? <laughs> Heavens, no. But then I start thinking about it. I'm not either. Come on. And all of you mightier than thou people, I'm going to come look in your closet. Oh, hello. See, there is no perfect human being. The only way we reach perfection is through the Lord Jesus Christ spirit inside of us that gives us that blood covering, amen? That's how we are perfect in the sight of God because Jesus paid on the cross that price for sin. And so we're covered by the blood of Jesus. God, I thank you for that, amen? So let's talk about this a little bit more. So what did we see leading up to the election? Oh, oh, let me back up. Let's roll the tape back. Let's go back four years. So once Trump was voted out, do y'all think that they, the devil decided just to leave him alone? Hello? I think the devil understood that this man was still a great threat to his kingdom. And so for the last four years, you've seen the devil unleash hell upon him. Literally. Literally. You have uh, weaponized Department of Justice, the weaponized FBI. Well, I hope everybody is hearing this on Facebook, and I hope I get kicked off. I don't care. Hallelujah. Let's face the facts. Let's put it in perspective today. And the reality is this. All throughout these three and a half, four years, God has had his hand on Trump. He's given him strength. And by the way, I didn't know this, but after Trump lost that election three and a half, four years ago, he went through a time period of depression. I don't know if I hadn't heard that before, but it, I read that, heard that from a real reliable source. It didn't last long, but Trump kind of hit bottom there for a little bit. I understand he wasn't eating very much. He, was, he really went through a time of very difficult times. And God took him out of that. Amen? God raised him up out of that. Now, if that's not true, y'all forgive me. I can't even remember the source. I read that, and I'm not trying to start something. But I could see that happening. I probably could see that. I could believe that would have happened. So when Trump came out, and then the devil unleashed the, the hounds of hell upon him and his family, I believe that God started making himself very, very, very real to him, step by step. He had to go into the fire for four years. I said he had to go to the back of the desert for four years. He had to go seek God. He had to go look for that burning bush, so to speak, for four years. And I do believe with all my heart, when God spared his life within a fraction of an inch, within a fraction of a second, that when that bullet pierced his ear and not his head, and when he came up out of that kneeling position with blood running on his face, and he raised a fist. He said, fight, fight, fight. I believe God had done a work for him at that moment. He didn't mean fight, fight, fight in the natural. He didn't mean, uh, I don't think he did. Maybe he did. I don't know. But all I know is that in the spirit man, he was declaring war. I said his spirit man was declaring war against the enemy that tried to kill him. And then the second time the 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 assassination plot was foiled, I believe God began to melt and show Trump that Jesus is Lord. Come on. There's never been a president in the history of our nation that has done more for Christianity than Trump did in his 2016 term. Y'all hear me? Every time the devil tries to choke out Christianity in this country, the enemy is defeated and God's man comes in. Hillary Clinton would have been as worse, if not more so, than Harris would have been. She would have. She was Jezebel incarnate. She's a Jezebel spirit. She is Jezebel when I read in the book. I'm telling you, it's her spirit. She's evil. Harris was just as bad, but yet God, in his infinite wisdom, sent a Jehu, the anointing of Jehu. Now, this doesn't get very pretty here, y'all, because when you go to war in the natural, you get your hands pretty dirty, and you get your hands pretty bloody in the natural. 
And back then, this was in the natural. It was God mandating it, but this was physical violence that occurred. So Jehu said, okay, Lord, where do I start? What do I do? Okay, you've anointed me to be the king. I'm not the king. I've anointed there. So what do I do? What happens? Well, God began to deal with him. And I believe that uh, when he walked out of that room with that little prophet with oil all over his head, his, uh, his servants, his soldiers around him said to him, is all well? He didn't look like all was well. He had oil poured over his head. I think he had a different expression in his face. It's all well. And then they said, why did this madman come to you? Who was the madman? The prophet. The little guy sent from Elisha to anoint him to be king. They considered him a madman. You know what the devil considers Jonathan Kahn and you and me and all the faith leaders? The devil considers us mad people. We're crazy. We're nuts. We believe in a God that's in control of everything. We believe that Jesus came to earth, died on uh, the cross, and resurrected uh, three days later. We're crazy. How dare us put our faith and our trust into something that is not seen? They think we're nuts. Folks, we know the truth. We're not deceived. They are. We're not nuts. They are for believing the lie. So Jehu says to them, you know the man and his babble. <laughs> That's all he said. He said to them, you know the man and his babble. And they said a lie. Tell us now. In other words, they are calling Jehu out. So he said, thus and thus spoke to me, saying, thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. Then each man hastened to take his garment and put it under him on the top of the steps, and they blew trumpets, saying, Jehu is king. Now, y'all got to think about this for a minute. <laughs> These soldiers were calling that little prophet a madman a few seconds before this, right? But when Jehu told his soldiers, his associates, that this little prophet had just anointed him to be king, what did they do? They honored the words of the prophet. They submitted immediately to it, and they raised their uh, stature, their, their axe, and they said, Jehu, you are the king of Israel. See how quickly God turns the table? The little prophet went from a madman to a hero in about three seconds. All you who are crazy enough to believe that God can deliver us from evil, you have gone from being crazy to being brilliant. And all the evil has been so embarrassed. I'm sorry. God did such a cool job here. I mean, it wasn't a little slim victory. It was a butt kicking. Hello. The other preacher's allowed to say that. Because when my Lord is kicking butt, I'm right there with him. How about y'all? Evil is what I'm talking about. God will never fail. He sees where we're at. He's heard the cries of America. Now, because we have got a Jehu in office, does that mean we're assured victory? Oh, no, we aren't. We have got to act and move and uh, continue our faith walk. We've got to continue our prayer like never before. We have just now entered into the battle. Hear me? Up until this point, Jehu had not entered the battle for the kingdom of Israel. He had just been spoken to. He had just been given a promise. Now what is he going to do with that promise? What is he going to do with that anointing that God has put on him? He has a choice. He can go about his lifestyle, doing what he's been doing, or he can follow the plan of God and walk into the call of God in his life, walk into the job that God has called him to do, 
It was up to Jehu. Well, this man who likes quick things, this man who's not patient, this man who acts, this man who drives furiously to get to where he's going, said, boys, lock and load. We're going to go see some kings. Oh, I'm liking this. You see, King Ahab had died. He was an evil king. His wife, Jezebel, was alive and well, and she was carrying on evil at during this time period we're talking about. So Ahab had some kids. He, uh, he had one of his kids that were the king, was the king, and uh, let's just try to follow this a little bit. The, the kingdom was under control of Ahab's descendant. So evil was at the very highest layer. So Jehu, he, uh, he said, you know what? We need to start at the top and work ourselves down. Let me tell you, when God gives you a task to do, don't do the easy part of that task first. Do the hard part first. Well, what do you mean by that? I'll tell you why. Oh, yeah, but if we do the easy part first, it'll build our faith. No, do the hard part first, and your faith will be so strong, you don't have to worry about the easy parts. You either trust God or you don't. You either accept your call or you don't. Don't play around with God's anointing on your life. Christians, let me tell y'all, every one of us in this room that serves Jesus Christ has an anointing on our life to defeat evil. You have the power, you have the authority by the Holy Ghost to go tear down the strongholds of the devil at the highest places. What are we waiting on? I hope we're not waiting. I hope we're trying to do that each and every day. So what happens? Jehu takes his men, and they go, and Joram, uh, Joram, J-O-R-A-M, he was a king at the time, and he returned. He was wounded. He returned. But when Jehu rode in on a chariot and went to Jezreel, where this Jezreel is the city, for Joram, who was the king, he was laid up there recovering, and Ahazi, king of Judah, had come down to see Joram. So you got two evil kings located in the same city where Jezebel lived. Everybody good with that? We'll call Jezreel, we'll call it Washington, D.C., that offend anybody? It was the hub. It was the center of the of the demonic. It was absolutely the center, the power place of the the forces of evil. I believe with all my heart that Washington, D.C., the enemy has done everything he can to turn that into the command center for evil and not for what God wanted it to be. Uh, Some people may even call it the swamp. Remember that? Well, let me tell you, draining the swamp is real. It's real. Because when Jehu and his group drove in to Jezreel, they found the two kings that were leading the Baal worshipers. They were preaching what Jezebel wanted them to do. It was an evil, evil, evil time for Israel and for Judah. And so Jehu went to the very source of evil and listen what he did. Now a watchman stood on the tower in Jezreel and as he came and he saw the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company of men. And Joram, Joram, Joram said, get a horseman and send him to meet them and let him say, is it peace? So, oh, you know, the devil's always wanting to know what's going on, right? Come on. The devil wants to know, you know, I wonder what the plan of God really is. Because the devil don't know what the plan of God is. God knows what the plan of the devil is. You have got a tactical advantage over the devil. You know what his plans are if you're listening to the Spirit of God. The devil don't know what God's plans is for your life. Hear me? He doesn't, unless God wants to reveal it to him, but he cannot know it supernaturally unless God reveals it. 
So the horsemen went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, is it peace? And Jehu said, What have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. <laughs> okay. So the guy who went out to ask a question has a decision to make. It's not peace. I can go back and tell them it's not peace, or I can just join their army. Being the smart man he was, he joined Jehu's army. Well, Joe Ram didn't have a good enough opinion, so he said, well, the first one didn't return. Send the second guy. So the second messenger went out, and he talked to Jehu, and he said, is it peace? And Joe Ram says, what have you to do with peace? Turn around and follow me. <laughs> nope. Yep, yep, think I will. So all of a sudden, two messengers have now been converted into Jehu's army. I love that, y'all. See how easy God can do? See how God can take an instrument of the devil and turn them immediately around and join God's army because those two guys obviously had a lot of tactical information. They had a lot of information they could use for Jehu, but so be it. Then Joe Ram said, make ready. Oh, make ready. And his chariot was made ready. Then Joram, king of Israel, and Ahazi, king of Judah, went out, each in his chariot, and they went out to meet Jehu and met him on the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. Who remembers Je Naboth? You know the one that Jezebel took his, his uh, plot of land? The one that Jezebel had Naboth killed and the blood of Naboth poured on that land? And, and so her husband Ahab could have that. Remember that? Well, there was a little prophecy that went forth there as well. But now you're beginning to see Jehu in bravery that he was. And i got to be honest with you. What in the world was Joram and Ahazi thinking to go out and meet this company of people led by Jehu with only two chariots? Anybody ever think like I do? What were they thinking? It wasn't peace or their messenger would have come back and told them peace. The devil is so confident. I said the devil will build false confidence in you, his follower, the followers of evil. He will build so much confidence that you may even appoint a feminine Tim Walls as your vice president candidate. I let that sink in for a minute. Really? Of all the people for vice president, do you really think that Walls was the best selection? Well, now they're trying to pin him for a loss of the can, you know, for loss of the election, trying to give him the bad rap. When the reality was, Harris was so overconfident that she was going to win, so overconfident that her master, the devil, had told her all this, and all of her little company of people around her was filling her head with all these thoughts that she can't lose. Well, Joe Ram and Ahazi had that same mentality. We're going to ride out there, and we're going to talk to this Jehu, and we're going to convince him that we are bad to the bone and we can't be defeated. You know what they got for their efforts? <laughs> Well, Joe Ram got an arrow between his shoulder and it came out of his heart. He died instantly. Ahazi went on the run, but an arrow found him, wounded him, and he died a short time later. Whoa, you think Jehu has started his cleansing with a pretty good start here? Two kings, two evil kings over two nations are now dead, gone, over with. And I got to get started here a little bit quicker. I got to move forward a little bit. So now what? I tell you what, we're going to work our way down the ladder. We're going to now take the two dead kings, and now we're going to march in, and we're going to cleanse up the rest of this mess. Let's start with the, with the 70 children of Ahab. Seven, Ahab was a busy man, 70 children. Y'all think about this. Seventy. And they had been hidden away and been taken care of in this country. Well, Jehu knew where they were at, went in there. I'll cut it short and paraphrase it. Basically told the people, unless you want me to come and destroy you, I want the heads of all 70 of them in a basket. Oh. 
You mean God God allowed that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because back then in the Old Testament, that's how you got rid of evil. You killed it. You purged it. So all 70 of those men died. Now, keep in mind, those people who killed the 70 were also bell worshipers. They had protected them. They were just scared if they didn't obey Jehu that they too would be killed. So they killed them, killed them, brought the heads. And then Jehu says, well, thank you, boys. And then he killed all of them. Y'all hear me? See, when you start getting rid of sin in your life, you've got to go all the way. You can't hold little pet sins in your life. You can't hold on to that vice that the Lord is telling you is a sin. You can't hold on to that. You have got to purge the sin out of your life with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. It gives you the power to be overcomers. Amen? The problem is we don't have power in the churches. We don't have fire in the churches because they have let sin abound. They're entertaining the 70 terrible brothers of the King Ahab. Folks, let me tell you, churches are going to get purged by the Holy Ghost. Churches are already starting to get purged by the Holy Ghost. I'm praying right now, God, every wicked leader of every church in this nation, get them to repent or take them out. We have got to have a purging starting at the highest level. And what does the judgment of God begin? In the house of God. You want an analogy between Joram and Ahazi and currently? Well, let me tell you, here, the house of God is where judgment is going to start first. And I'm ready for it. How about you? How dare, how dare Rick Warren? How dare T.D. Jakes? How dare these faith leaders endorse a candidate that is nothing more than a Jezebel spirit? How dare them? I said, how dare them? And every Christian who went to the poll and pulled the lever for evil agenda, shame on you. you got to repent and ask God to forgive you and turn away from your iniquity and find Jesus again. Amen? And while we're doing this, let's just go ahead and make everybody mad. You 30% of Christians who are too righteous to go and vote for Trump, God help you too. Shame on you. Because us 70% carried your load. And I don't want you on my back anymore. Amen. Come on. That 30% who stayed home and didn't vote, they are going to enjoy the religious freedoms just like you and I did. They're going to ride on our coattails. Well, let me tell you, there's coming a day when they're not going to be able to ride on your coattail because every man is going to stand before God and he's going to give an accounting for what he has done and what he hasn't done. And I'm telling you this morning, it's time for God's church to arise and get into battle and take everything back. Now, do I know if this will happen or not? I don't know. How about that? I know it will happen if we do our part. Am I preaching that? America is going to turn all the way back to God? I could only hope so. I suspect not. Well, that's the downer, Lonnie. No, I think we've got a reprieve here. How about y'all? I think we've got time to do good things for the Lord. I think we've got time to get people saved because Jesus is coming soon. All right, so let me continue real quick. So Jehu goes to the next level, and I'm, not, I'm just going to really skip through most of this, but he begins purging every layer of government that Ahab had put in place. He killed them all. He killed them all. He killed them all. And so now when he gets to this, uh, his last city, he goes in and Jehu has now got rid of government, but the believers of Baal are still alive and well. The Baal worshipers are still alive and well. What, is, what does he do, Jehu? He goes into the city and he says, basically, he's a liar. I mean, Jehu lies, flat out lies. He says to them, you know, your previous king was a bell worshiper, but I'm a bigger one. So I want us to have a big celebration. 
every Baal worshiper in this country, you are now requested to come to the temple, and you must come to the temple. If you don't come to the temple, I will kill you. So you got to come to the temple so we can all worship Baal together. Ah, wow. That Jehu was devious little fellow, wasn't he? Yeah, who in the world can you trust, right? And, uh, you know, all, all the soldiers with him, they knew what was going on. So sure enough, the day comes, all the bell worshipers come into the temple, and they're given a robe. They're identified very clearly. Jehu says, is there any righteous among you that's not a bell worshiper? They all looked around, no, 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 there's no one righteous here. We're all bell worshipers. Well, I'll make a long story short. Every one of them were killed. Y'all hear me? Jehu's men walked into that temple and slaughtered every bell worshiper. You want to put a stop to evil? Kill the source. I'm, I don't mean physically, violently, bloody. I'm talking about in the spirit. I am not preaching violence in the physical. I'm going to repeat that for about the third or fourth time. I'm telling you, the Old Testament is a type and shadow of the New Testament and the type and shadow that Jehu, who was told, uh, the Lord told Trump that he was a follow the template. Remember that word in that prophecy? Follow the template of Jehu. Well, a template is a pattern. It is something that you do step by step by step. So if the Lord has commanded Trump to follow the template of Jehu, then we ought to see the, the leaders of evil start coming down, not by death, but by spiritual strongholds being broken. For example, all those people had partied with Diddy. I wouldn't want to do your Diddy at all, amen? You may end up in prison. Wouldn't that be awesome? All you people who have been in government, who has been corrupt, who's lied, all you FBI agents who's lied, all you CIA agents who've lied, all you Department of Justice who has falsely persecuted, you lied. Come on now, expose it, amen? That's what we've been praying. Well, that's the template of Jehu. You expose it, you deal with it, and then it comes down. And when you take out the leadership, the people of authority, guess what? Then you deal with the lower ranks, Come on. And they get dealt with also. I'm here to tell you, we have got to support like never before this purging of America and turn it around, go from bell worshiping to the Lord Jesus Christ worshiping. I've got hope this morning. How about you? I believe this morning that God can do anything and everything because Jehu followed the template that God had prepared for him. And Jehu, this is going to shock you, never, ever turned away from his own personal sins. He never repented. He still worshiped the golden calves. Now, that blows my mind. How about y'all? I'm not saying Trump is not going to be 100% Christian. I love what the man said. He has become a witness for Jesus. He has. He said it very loud and very clearly. He is, uh, you know, he believes there's a Jesus. He believes his life was spared for a reason. He believes Jesus spared his life. Will Trump ever become the Christian that we want him to be? I don't know. But does that mean he's not the Jehu for today? No, it doesn't. It means that God can use him and will use him as long as Trump submits, amen? As long as he submits. So, folks, I don't know what the next four year holds but I like it a lot. Amen? I like the hope I feel. I do. I like the feeling that our God answered prayers in a miraculously gigantic way that cannot be denied this was God. This was God. You don't take back the house. Now, I think we're going to get that. Uh, I'm, someone may tell me, has that already been decided this morning? I don't know. It was close. Uh, who controls the House of Representatives, still in the battle. Well, I, believe we're gonna, I believe the Republicans will win that. I do. 
and the Senate and now the presidency. Let me tell you, it sounds like God installed a whole new authority in our nation to me. Amen? Why did he do it? Pray it. America hit its knees. And then guess what happened? People actually acted upon their prayers, except for the few handful of Christians who didn't. But people went out and voted. They took action. Now we could have all prayed our we could have all prayed to our, our our head exploded, but if we hadn't gone to the ballot box, I'm talking about across the country, and voted, we would have hair today. You know? So this morning, look up. My Jesus is coming soon, amen? He's preparing. He knows what's going on in world events. And I don't know if you've heard this in the last day or two, but all these foreign leaders are calling Trump and saying, what a good guy you are. Can we play with you? I would not want to be the Iranian president that has ordered a hit on Trump. Trump's not going to play nice, nor should he. You know, we don't know what all is going to go on. We don't know, but I'm telling you this. When God has got his hand in something, it will not fail. So let's bring this down to our level. If God is capable and he is able, and he certainly is, he never failed me yet. Remember that song we just sang? Well, if God is able to put them tremendously complex pieces together like we have witnessed this week, don't you think he's able to handle your problem? So no matter what you've been battling this morning, no matter what your fragmented life has looked like, no matter where the enemies attacked you at over the last four years or 10 years or 100 years, whatever, no matter what that area that you've been attacked in, understand my God has got a template to get you out. And it starts with on your knees saying, Jesus, I trust you, I love you, use me, give me a mission for you, and I will follow your voice. Amen? Let's get our eyes off of our problems, and let's get our eyes on Jesus, the solver of our problems, and guess what? He will use you, even though you're not perfect. Hello? I said, even though you're not perfect. And if any of you think you're not perfect, if anybody doesn't think that you're not perfect, (laughs) that just proves to me you're not perfect. (laughs) Come on. It's the truth. See, God knows it all. He's got a plan for you. Stand to your feet.